let's get started here. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, um, OWASP, um, and I'm uh, very proud to be a, a longstanding member of OWASP. It's a great organization. Uh, thank you to the OWASP programming team, uh, Mark Miller, uh, and the, the rest of the, uh, the folks that uh, are facilitating this today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my session is going to be on security chaos engineering uh, and and how it can help turn the tide in a war on uncertainty and how we build um, modern software. So um, and, and especially how we secure that modern software. So uh, right at the bottom, you'll see um, my Twitter information at Aaron Reinhardt. Please feel free to DM me anytime. My DMs are open. All right, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is chaos engineering. I'm going to explain uh, what its applications of, to cybersecurity are and how to do that. I'm going to talk a bit about um, also complexity in modern software. I'm going to talk about the use cases uh, you can use chaos engineering for for security. We're going to talk about uh, a light uh, experiment framework, uh, and I'll give an example of security chaos engineering experiment. Um, so let's get started here. Okay. Oh yeah, here's, here's my background. So um, I'm the former Chief of Security Architect at United Health Group. I'm uh, currently I'm the CTO at Verica.io. I started Verica uh, with Casey Rosenthal, the creator of Chaos Engineering at Netflix. He is my co-founder. Uh, I'm a frequent speaker and author on, in, 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 uh, on, in the domains of chaos engineering uh, and security. Um, I'm the O'Reilly, uh, I wrote, the, I recently wrote the O'Reilly book on security chaos engineering with Kelly Shortridge, and we're actually writing the larger book now, but I also helped write uh, the main body of knowledge for chaos engineering with Casey. Um, and let's get started. Let's go on. Um, the issue with the, that we're trying to combat with chaos engineering, uh, especially for security, um, is uh, is we're not we don't seem to be outages, outages breaches and incidents seem to be happening more and more often. It, they seem to be getting larger, uh, and uh, either way, from a from a uh, grade a grade or a score, uh, we don't a scorecard. We don't seem to be getting much better at what we're doing. Um, why is this? Uh, I'll give you some of my theses and, and what I believe uh, why this is happening, um, and what I think we might be doing wrong. Um, the problem is, is, is one of complexity, is that our systems have evolved beyond our human ability to mentally model their behavior. Uh, because of the size, scale, speed, and complexity of modern software, things like the public cloud, once you start adopting like the public cloud, DevOps, CICD practices, um, you know, uh, and, um, you know, adopting the microservice architecture models, it's and our systems just are, are moving at such a pace uh, and that they're in their the scale they operate is like nothing we've ever seen before. And it's very difficult for us as humans to mentally model what's going on in that post deployment world. So chaos engineering and security and its applications to security um, are really what we're we're not really targeting the sort of the build process with our experiments. It's the post deployment world that is becoming overly complex. Uh, and I'll explain more, more about that here in a minute. But I just want to draw, draw your attention to this little diagram on, on the left hand side of the slide you'll see a bunch of dots and, and that are connected. Um, each dot represents a microservice. Okay, what's happening is, is that like when you have like a, a system mm -hmm. with 10 microservices, you don't actually have 10 of them. You may have, uh, first and foremost, you may have a different group of humans working on each microservice. Uh, you probably have at least three or four microservices. Uh, 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 three of each micro, three or four of each microservice running for throughput reasons. On top of that, you might have older versions running uh, to, to support other functionality and other services because microservices, believe it or not, are not independent, they're dependent. Um, so what happens is you may have at the gate, you may have, I don't know, five to 10 to 15 of each service because you also may be uh, doing blue green deployments and testing out new functionality in some services. So it gets really complex really quickly. The problem is, is no group of humans anywhere in that model has a really good understanding of what the system looks like post deployment. And it's hard for us humans to, to model that in our brains because we need to abstract and simplify. So, but th this is the crux of the problem is the complexity is magnifying because of speed and scale. So where does the complexity come from? Well, um, you know, there are a couple different schools of thought here, but there, there's, a, there's a central complexity uh, comes from things like Conway's law. So the way that organizations design, uh, the way that like 
you know, basically Conley's law states that organizations who are destined to design computer systems reflect the way they communicate as a business. Um, that you can't really change that complexity that comes from that from that venue from that uh, that uh, that avenue without uh, changing the business itself. The other is accidental complexity, the way and methodologies and the way we build software. Uh, but the problem with software is that it only increases the complexity. So, but all these other techniques you're seeing on here, like you see DevOps, you see continuous integration, you see cloud computing, service meshes, microservices, auto scaling, circuit breaker patterns. These, but you're like, Aaron, these are all things that help us deliver value to market much faster. Yes, but they also increase, they, they also increases the, uh, our ability to, to the scale and, and to change things quickly, which also is inherently related to complexity. Um, and we'll talk more about this as we go on. So uh, newsflash, uh, I love this slide. The new OSI model is software, 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 software. Pretty much layer two and above is pretty much all software now. Uh, and it's officially has taken over. The problem with that is, is it only ever increases the complexity. You know, so it, let's say you have a complex software system, right? And say you wanted to make it simple. Well, there's a relationship between changing something and, um, you know, uh, and it, it making it more complex. The more you change, the more the more more complexity you add. Uh, and um, you know, if you wanted to make a complex system simple, you have to change it to do that, right? So you're just really you're not actually simplifying. You're just moving complexity around. So chaos engineering, what we're, we're going to talk about is it's about navigating the complexity. It's not about trying to simplify it. So, um, and, and that's really what we're trying to do here uh, is, is um, and that's what, so chaos engineering allows us to um, ensure that the system is actually reflecting what um, it actually exhibits the characteristics that we believe it's, that we designed it to initially uh, um, operate under. Um, so a good example would be, um, is every, every company has a legacy system, right? Some of the characteristics for legacy systems could be, um, you know, that they're, they're mostly known for being stable. Uh, engineers are somewhat confident and competent on how to operate the system. It rarely has outages or incidents or issues, you know, but it's legacy because it's business critical, right? I mean, if we want to, uh, we would get rid of it if it wasn't, right? Well, um, the question I formed, uh, I formed in my mind a few years ago is like, was, was, was the legacy system always so stable? Well, um, they weren't right. Is 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 the, is the answer is that we slowly learned about how the system actually worked versus how we thought it worked through a series of unforeseen events, surprises. Uh, there were surprises because we would have known. Uh, surprises means incidents and outages. If they weren't surprises, we would have just fixed them, right? Well, um, well, uh, the learning. So, like learning learning about how the system actually works uh, versus how we thought it works uh, through incidents and outages. Is a very expensive and counterproductive exercise. Yes, slowly we learned uh, that it, the system worked a different way than we thought. We were able to fix it, recalibrate it, and we, over time we developed a better understanding. But that process encountered a lot of pain, a lot of pain for customers, a lot of pain for the engineers. So what you can think about is chaos engineering. Chaos engineering is a proactive exercise of, of introducing, uh, uh, you know, I'd say, um, uh, uh, so it's a proactive exercise of introducing turbulent conditions into a system or service to try to understand the conditions by which it will fail before it actually fails. Um, and so what's great about chaos engineering is we're not actually causing chaos. What we're trying to do is proactively ensure that the system act can actually um, do what it's supposed to do under the conditions we designed it for. If you think about things like uh, failover logic or circuit breakers or, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, yeah, fill fillers or circuit breakers, even security controls. Those those code paths rarely ever get exercised until they're actually needed. Uh, and when they're needed, it's usually some sort of catastrophic event. The problem is, is that our systems, the rest of the system has changed a lot since we originally designed those code paths. And those code paths might not work uh, the way we think they're supposed to work when we need them. Uh, same thing with security. We often build uh, detection and pre prevention types of controls and capabilities under a certain context and understanding, uh, and, but the system often changes a lot before those uh, controls actually come into use. So what we're trying to do is proactively ensure that the system still does the things it's supposed to instead of learning about learning that we didn't understand the system through an outage or, or a security incident. Um, part of this problem is, is that system engineering is a messy exercise. Okay, in the beginning, in the beginning, we love to 
Um, you know, we love to think the system is very simple, right? We've got a plan, we've got our time, we've got, we got the resources, we've got the, uh, the engineering team put together, we've got our Docker images, our, our secrets taken care of, we get, so we've got our different environments. And of course, we have a beautiful 3D uh, AWS diagram. Well, in, in reality, our system never looks like this, okay? Um, it, it's because um, after a few weeks, after a few months, we start learning about what we didn't actually know about the system, right? Uh, after, um, you know, after the first week, uh, we had an outage on the payments API. So we have the hard coded token. Uh, marketing team comes down and says, we have to refactor the pricing modules. We refactor, right? And we go from incident to incident to incident. Which, well, but these are what these incidents are informing us is the, 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 that difference between what we, how we thought the system worked and how it actually worked. Uh, and then over time, uh, it, it just continues to magnify in our system. What they call, what Sidney Decker calls this, he's one of the world's experts in, in complex systems uh, in terms of safety engineering. He likes to call this the drift into failure, the drift into the unknown in a complex system. So in the end, the summary is, is that our systems have become more complex and messy than we originally remember them being. All right, so what does all this have to do with security? I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Okay, so security is a context-dependent discipline. So what I mean by that is, is that, so I've been a builder most of my career, software engineer predominantly most of my career before I got into security. Uh, and so as an engineer, I need the flexibility and convenience to change something. That's my job. I'm trying to, so I'm constantly trying to change something because I'm trying to deliver value to market via product, you know, delivery to customer, right? So I'm constantly trying to deliver on that promise. You know, so I'm constantly building and delivering uh, you know, th those, uh, that, that value. Uh, but security is a context dependent discipline. You need to know what you're trying to secure in order to know, in order to, in order to know what needs to be secured about it. So we're kind of forced into a staple understanding of a thing in order to actually manifest the security. What happens is, is that uh, what's happening is we're starting to see a, a, a drift issue between the rate of change of the actual system and the security being able to maintain alignment with um with uh, its original context and understanding. With chaos engineering, especially for security, we're introducing the conditions that our controls were originally designed for to, to make sure that we can catch, uh, uh, to, under, to make sure we can catch the, the drift uh, out of effectiveness of the control before it actually, uh, before an adversary can take advantage of the fact that we didn't, uh, we, we didn't realize that the security control needed recalibration. Uh, and um, so that's, that's kind of the crux here. Um, chaos engineering. Uh, so in terms of like instrumentation for software, uh, Casey and I like to sort of um, uh, refer to uh, break, break them down into sort of two domains. There's testing and there's experimentation. Experimentation. So testing is a verification or validation of something you already know to be true or false. You know what you're looking for before you go looking for. In our world, that's a, like a CVE, that's an attack pattern, that's a signature, things like that. Where experimentation, we're trying to derive new information that we previously did not know. And uh, this is where chaos engineering fits in. We're not trying to uh, do a simple uh, test. What we're trying to do is uh, experiment and I'm trying to generate new context and understanding about how the system is operating post-deployment. So how do we typically discover when our security measures fail? Well, it's typically through some sort of footstep in the sand, some observable event, um, some context the computer tells us, meaning it could be a log event, it could be an alert, uh, it could be, um, and usually the, the problem is, is that we often only discover that our security measures were not effective and when there's a security incident. But unfortunately, security incidents are not an effective measure of detection because it's often too late. So what happens during a security incident? Okay, well, in shorthand, people freak out, you know, um, and this is not a good learning environment uh, for, especially for the engineers, right? Uh, is that, so we don't do chaos engineering here, right? When there's an active incident or an issue. Um, we do chaos engineering when there is no problem to proactively understand so we don't in, so we don't end up in this situation we do it here right we proactively try to build an understanding um, uh, about uh, whether or not the security still does what it's supposed to do before uh, before we run into situations where we're freaking out it'll make more sense when I go through a couple of examples uh, so chaos engineering so the Netflix definition of chaos engineering was the discipline of experimentation on distributed systems would to build confidence in a system's ability to withstand turbulent conditions. Or like I said before, it's the practice of proactively introducing uh, failure conditions or faults into a system or service to try to understand the conditions by which the system or service will fail before it actually fails. Instead of chasing outages, we're proactively just ensuring the system does what it was originally designed to do. <coughs> 
Um, so chaos engineering, very important. It's not about breaking things in production. It's not about breaking things. Don't, 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 don't uh, go home, go back to your job uh, work and say you want to do chaos engineering to break stuff. I'm pretty sure you get fired. So it's about proactively um, uh, uh, fixing things. We're trying to fix things, right? We, we want to establish order, not create chaos. So uh, there's several books on chaos engineering. I mentioned a couple of them earlier. Uh, actually, there'll be links to download them. I highly recommend you, you download them both now if you're watching this, because I'm not sure, I think one of uh, both of these, I think will expire soon on the free download. You can only sponsor the book forever. You can't sponsor it forever. So <clears throat> I highly recommend you go get that book. Uh, the links will be at the end. So um, security chaos engineering. Well, newsflash, it's not a whole lot different than chaos engineering. Um, and so, as so, one before I sort of explain security chaos engineering, I want to want to remind um, uh, everyone of how, how I see software engineering is that engineers don't believe well, we don't believe in two things. We don't believe in hope and luck. I mean, we believe in good instrumentation, and data, and feedback loops. That's that's our that's what we believe in. I mean, hope and luck it worked in Star Wars, but doesn't really work in engineering. Okay, what we're trying to establish with security chaos engineering is understand. <coughs> excuse me. Where our security gaps and needs for recalibration are before an adversary can take advantage of them. So, um, a use case um, uh, that I like to talk about uh, in for security chaos engineering will be instant response. Uh, I'm going to cover a few other use cases as well. Uh, but um, the main problem with instant response itself is that it's a response. So, um, before I do that, I'm just going to explain a couple of the use cases you can use it for. Uh, you can use, uh, uh, oh, by the way, all of these use cases are well documented in this book, and they're going to be expanded on the larger book. Uh, so um, you can you can dive into the detail later if you'd like. Um, uh, where I started with chaos engineering for security would be uh, security control validation. Uh, I was trying, as the chief security architect, I wanted to ensure that post-deployment, uh, the security mechanisms and, and controls and things like that were actually being implemented correctly. I mean, because configuration matters, how it's configured, how it's placed, how many of them, where they are, you know, uh, and uh, there's too much subjective process in the assessment between me and the computer. I need to ask the computer a question and instrumentation is a great way to do that. So I created a new methodology uh, with uh, and a new open source tool that actually uh, allowed me to do that. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, another great uh, use case is security observability. Uh, one the, it's one of the biggest problems in software security, in my opinion. Um, is that uh, it helps you uh, because you're proactively introducing uh, conditions uh, if, uh, that should security control should fire on. You actually um, you can get a better understanding of how uh, of what did the log data make sense that you got from the control. Did like if this were a real incident, do we have enough log information to correlate alerts? Did it correlate an alert? Did uh, we understand what the alerts uh, or did the uh, SOC analyst uh, understand the alerts and what to do with it? Uh, another great um, uh, use case for is compliance. Um, is compliance every chaos experiment, whether it's availability or stability based or security based, has compliance values. So don't make sure you just keep the output in a high integrity way uh, and label it with the right control framework. So back to incident response. So uh, the problem with uh, incident response is the response, and that security incidents are, are somewhat subjective. No matter <clears throat> how much money you spend, how, how many people you have in security. You know, um, but you still don't know a lot of things. You don't know where it's going to happen, why it's happening, who's trying to get, uh, who's trying to get in, uh, how they're going to get in, and what they're trying to achieve, right? Um, but what, what's it, what's great about chaos engineering is we're proactively introducing the conditions ourselves. We, it's managed, right? We're introducing um, a misconfiguration of some kind, and we can watch it because now we're not waiting for something to happen and try to figure out do we, uh, you know, uh, if we we're prepared or not because you know, like that's. Um, that's a very subjective way of doing it. What we're doing is introducing a objective signal into the system and watching it. So, you know, we could, when we start do, introducing these experiments, we can now, because we know the point it started, right? So we can look to see whether the technology was effective at doing what it's supposed to do. We can, uh, we can uh, manage and measure things like, uh, did the, were the run books correct? Did we have enough people on call? Did they know what to do? Uh, did we follow the process correctly? Um, and, uh, um, that, that could be a great and a highly valuable feedback for uh, sharpening the incident response process. 
So Chaos Slinger. Chaos Slinger was the first ever application of Netflix's Chaos Engineering to cybersecurity. It is now a deprecated tool out there on GitHub, uh, but um, there uh, it represents a framework on actually how to write security chaos experiments through a series of Python-based lambdas. Uh, and it's fairly easy to understand uh, the framework uh, if you check it out. It's also documented in the O'Reilly report. So uh, the main example when we open source Chaos Slinger uh, was a uh, we, we wrote several experiments for Chaos Slinger, but the uh, one of the main example we needed an example that a lot of whether you're a software engineer, a network engineer, a systems engineer, uh, a, an executive that you could understand what we're trying to do uh, and the value we're trying to achieve. And for some odd reason, misconfigured or, un or unauthorized port changes steep kills still happen a lot of, uh, um, a lot of the time, even in the cloud. So um, what we did was United Health Group, when I was there, we were the, we were very new to, the, to AWS. And, and what, we, um, what we started doing is, is um, so our um, the assumption is, is that when we introduce a misconfigured or unauthorized port change into our AWS instances, we expected the firewall to immediately kind of detect and block that kind of activity and be a non-issue. So what we did was, is that we would, uh, Sort of randomly select a, a through a series of AWS tags. You can see how this works on the repo for Chaos Slinger on GitHub. But it'll select a series of tags to be opt in or opt out. Uh, if it's opted in, that means it's you. That we we're able to actually do the experiment on that instance. Uh, but we would open or close a port that wasn't already open or closed. What we're trying to do uh, is um, you know is sort of trigger to make make sure that the firewall actually was detecting. Uh, um, in preventing what we thought it was supposed to prevent and detect. What actually happened was, uh, it only worked about 60% of the time, uh, is that what we learned was actually there was a configuration drift issue between how our non-commercial and our commercial software AWS environments. Easy. Remember, there was no incident, there was no war room, there was no, uh, nobody's freaking out. Uh, we proactively realized we had a drift issue, we'd be able to fix it, right? So the second thing we learned was, is the cloud native configuration management tool caught caught the change and bought it every time. So something we're barely paying for, didn't even, we didn't even expect this to happen, uh, caught it and bought it every time. So that was very interesting to learn that. So the third thing we learned is we didn't really have a SIM. We wrote our own sort of security big data lake solution. Uh, and um, uh, I did not have a whole lot of confidence that actually our, their alert would get generated from uh, that from the logs that came uh, from the controls, but it actually did. According to the alert, the alert went to the SOC the problem is, is that when a SOC got the alert, they couldn't tell which AWS environment it came from. Uh, and uh, it, as an engineer, you're saying, oh, Aaron, I can map back the IP address and forgot where it came from. Yeah, you can, but that could take 15 to 20 minutes, maybe. Uh, and, or it could take an hour if SNAT is in play, because SNAT intentionally hides the real IP address. So you could, uh, you know, that's a long time to be, uh, if, especially if that's an outage. Okay, uh, but here's the great thing. There was no outage. Remember, nobody freaked out because we were being proactive and we did discover this, that um, we, uh, um, you know, uh, all we had to do is add metadata to the alert and it solved, the problem solved. So that's kind of the value in doing some of this. You can find more about this, like I said, in the O'Reilly report. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, you can actually download that report at this link and download both books. Uh, um, here are the links to both. Um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Uh, it's somewhat a brief brief presentation on security chaos engineering, but like I said, you can find more on both of these resources about it. Thank you.